that's being hosted by the SMAP Multi-Tier Framework uh, team, MTF team. And um, I think today is going to be particularly exciting since uh, we're getting our hands dirty with looking at how can energy surveys best be designed. And this is uh, critically important because uh, any survey leads to a better understanding of uh, the data. Um, and data can inform both project design as well as policy formulation, uh, help, help with policy um, uh, formulation. So um, this um, webinar will focus on practical uh, knowledge and uh, aims to empower all of you participants uh, to uh, do better energy service design, but also uh, potentially, and in a discussion segment, we'd like to hear back from you on what you think um, can also be done uh, better. Um, data is critically important, not only for projects, but also um, for uh, policy making um, and investments to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, what we see over and over again in, in international policy making is that once a target is set, it focuses policymakers' mind on achieving that target. But it can only be achieved once policymakers also agree on a mechanism on how to measure the progress towards these goals. And so this is critically important, and we see that over and over again in, in the political debate internationally, um, that oftentimes uh, governments cannot agree on tracking data. But here in uh, on the SDGs, we are uh, you know, in, in the comfortable position that we can actually contribute to, um, to this process. <clears throat> so surveys obviously uh, produce um, data, and um, data um, tools are critically important, or uh, you know, energy uh, surveys are critically important, not only to uh, generate the data of, you know, for example, access, but also how affordable um, household energy is, and um, what the actual demand is, and underlying this, of course, also willingness to pay uh, analysis. And uh, today we're going to learn a little bit more about how such energy surveys are uh, implemented and how you can troubleshoot them. And there are both practical methods on rendering them easier and there's uh, technology that can help as well. Um, the, um, this webinar uh, is focused on um, you know, we'll, we'll have energy experts today available from the MTF team and the Living Standard Measurement Team uh, of the World Bank's uh, Development Data Group. Since 2016, the MTF team has conducted comprehensive national energy service in more than 25 countries. They've produced core energy data analytics uh, to support energy operations and regional initiatives at the World Bank. The MTF team will share their energy survey and data analytics expertise through this webinar. We also have survey experts from the LSMS team who are collaborating with the MTF team. The LSMS team will share their invaluable insights on performing national surveys. So um, I have to say this webinar has a very impressive lineup of uh, panelists. Uh, Bonsuk uh, will kindly present them. And after the presentations, um, the uh, speakers and panelists um, will discuss how energy surveys and data can facilitate scaling up operations and investment. I hope you enjoy today's session and we're looking forward um, to, um, to your feedback and comments. And uh, big thanks to everyone who's worked hard to making this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fanny, for the uh, great uh, opening remark. So, as the next um, the next session, we're gonna have um, an SMS team to make a presentation on the uh, the, the fundamental of the survey. Okay. So, in the energy GP, um, sometimes explicitly or implicitly, we are doing a lot of energy survey, but at the same time, sometimes like energy GP and the practitioner, we mainly focus more on the energy part, but not necessarily on the uh, survey. But from our experience in the MTF team, it is 
tremendously like a beneficial to work and to collaborate with the LSMS team on the design of the survey, implementation, monitoring, and data analysis and everything. So I want to invite uh, Mimi, um, who, is, um, who is managing the LSMS team, to have a presentation on the survey fundamenta. So over to you, uh, Mimi. Great. Hi, everyone. So um, I will just make a slight correction that I'm not managing the LSMS team, <laughs> but myself, um, along with Amparo, we've been coordinating basically the technical assistance that um, the LSMS team gives to GPs, like the Energy GP in Conducting mm -hmm. Service, and national statistical offices across the world in, you know, implementing better service so we have higher quality data because you know one thing is to have data another thing is for it to actually be good so that's what we do and we are always happy to help we've had a successful relationship with um the energy gp now since 2016 and i think maybe that's our longest standing collaboration with the gp so we excited to continue working with you guys so um i'm gonna just I know a lot of you know about the LSMS team, but I thought there might be some people that don't. So just a quick summary of what we do. And then we're going to go through the steps of a survey design um, project, like designing a survey and implementing it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the collaboration between our two teams. So the Living Standards Measurement Study, LSMS team. So people say Living Standards Measurement Survey, but it's study because we do more than just the surveys. So this is the bank's um, flagship household survey program, and the focus has been to help strengthen um, survey systems in World Bank client countries with the goal to help improve the quality of micro data so that we can better inform um, policies. This has been around since the 1980s. Obviously, I haven't been at the banks in the 1980s, but <laughs> the program has been around for that long. And the initial focus was on poverty, helping households, you know, measure poverty, which is a key goal of the bank, as we all know. But it's expanded to other areas like labor, climate, human capital, energy, because we want to be able to understand the drivers of these different um, sectors of a household. You want to know the link between energy and health in a household, the link between welfare and, and labor and energy access to the household. So this kind of, you know, this trying to find this relationship between the different sectors has expanded this multi-topic surveys that there are so many models covered in it but the richness of the data that you get from it i think it's just it's incredible so how does the lsms program work we have three main um buckets of work one is data production where we support the design and implementation of um, surveys household surveys farm surveys firm surveys facility surveys but because we are constantly trying to improve the way data is collected, the way surveys is implemented so that we can have better quality data, we also do a lot of methodological work, testing new tools, testing new methods, so that we can find better ways to ask households or firms or farmers how, you know, the information that we need from them and feeding that back into the questionnaires that we end up um, implementing. So, a very, very important part of our work is this methodological experiment because it makes us learn. We improve the way we collect data. Energy is a good example. We were first asking people, do you have access to power or not? Yes, no. Tells you nothing about what the household needs. But now we have the MTF framework, so it's now better. And a lot of countries are now adopting this better method. And this is basically the goal of our methods and tools work. And of course, policy research. So we get all this data. You need to say, what does the data say? So we also do research, not just us, but with a lot of our, our partners, but we do a lot of research on that team. So these are the three buckets of the um, LSMS work program. And just to kind of brag a little bit, in the past five years, we've supported about 78 countries across the world. And this ranges from just simply reviewing a questionnaire to tell you whether it's good or not, to very detailed support, like what we provide to the SMAP team, which is basically supporting you through the entire um, survey life cycle. So we have a lot of experience and we're always happy to help. So always reach out to us. So now going to the process of the survey design and implementation. So we like to say we have a survey cycle. 
you start from your planning organization all the way to dissemination. If you do not disseminate the data, in our opinion, you haven't completed the cycle. So you basically go through the different stages, but I will just go through them one by one. So the key, the first part is your survey plan. You cannot just want to do a survey and just go put some questions together and just go. You have to think through the entire process, like what's your sampling going to be? What is objective that you want to achieve? and what kind of questions to help you achieve this objective. How much would it cost to collect this data? And what type of training would you need to do? What kind of, um, even to the sensitization of letting people in the area you're going to interview know about the survey so that people are open to, to respond to you. So we talk about the survey planning that when you want a, a survey to be successful, then that means that you have to invest a lot in the survey preparation. You don't want to catch issues when you're in the field. You want to prepare really well in the beginning before you get to the power you're actually um, collecting data. So I know I might be going through some of this a little fast, but we do have a LSMS course that people can take that takes you through how to implement a survey really well. So this is just a summary of, of that course. So sampling, this is the one where most people do not know how to do it. Always, always hire a sampling expert. They nev never try to do sampling yourself. There are like five of us from the LSMS team here, and none of us here is a sampling expert. <laughs> we actually have sampling experts on our team for this purpose because it's basically one of the key aspects of doing a survey is having a good sample that can be representative of that population you want to talk about. And if you don't have that good sample, then your data is just basically about the people you interviewed. You cannot extrapolate it to any larger group. And the whole purpose that you want policymakers to be able to use this data. So it's very important to have a good sampling expert that can give you the different scenarios and also do a listening exercise so you update your um, sampling film to make sure you have the current information for the households you're going to be interviewing. So the, the question is, um, Brian was saying, you have to have a good question here too, right? So the design process is not about what the bank wants to do, but also what the countries want. So we always say consult with stakeholders, the people that are gonna benefit the most from the survey are the, the clients, at least for the World Bank, our countries are our clients. If the survey doesn't serve them, then there's no point. So always consult with the different stakeholders, even other partners that we have that are also working in the field, like WHO, for example, when we're talking about um, putting together a guidebook I'll talk about later. Then check that you have the latest, you know, best practices and you apply to your survey. After you drop the questionnaire, make sure you test it, that it works, review it, revise it as needed, finalize it, but go through this entire process because a terrible questionnaire, it doesn't matter what how <laughs> best everything else is, you're just going to get crappy data. So always just go through that process and like you say, we're always here to, to advise and review and provide comments on making it better. So for mode of data collection, we use survey solutions a lot. It's a um, copy software, which I think some of you know already. But for many household surveys now, including the energy surveys, everything is done on copy, right? We hardly ever use paper anymore. But since the pandemic, phone surveys have also become popular. So we're not just interviewing households in person with copy, but we also conduct some surveys over the phone, which then makes it um, copy. I sometimes do a combination and it's some of the things that we've discussed also with um, Brian and team that for the face-to-face -face surveys where you have really long questionnaires and you have to do them in person, sometimes there are some indicators that you want to collect more frequently and they're shorter. You can do those over the phone to the same sample that you interviewed over the phone. Just so many innovative ways now to collect information and collect data without burdening the households too much, but also getting data at the level um, that you need. If you need something every month, you don't want to visit the household every month, but maybe you can send them a few questions and call them over the phone or even text them and then they will respond. So they just, you know, different ways in which we can um, get information that we need now. And then for the field work preparation. So again, this is part of your, make sure you're prepared for this survey. So you have the field work plan. How many interviewers, how many supervisors will go? How will they, how much time will they spend in each village community that they go to? What's the field work protocol? If something goes wrong, who do you call first? What do you do? How are you going to monitor the data that's coming in? We just don't wait till the survey is over to say, oh, how good is the quality of the data? No, you have a monitoring plan to make sure that at every stage of the um, survey process, you're monitoring 
the work. You have the sensitization plan. You want to make sure that the people are aware that this is going on and they're, you know, open to answering the questions. I think um, interviewing household is one of the most difficult things ever because most of us, when people call us, even ask us survey questions over the phone, we don't answer. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. So I really respect respondents that take their time to, um, to answer us. And then the communication plan to make sure that the different teams, those in the field, those in headquarters, all have a plan to, you know, communicate properly and feedback information as, as needed. So now pre-test and pilot of the survey. So you have your questionnaire, you've done all the things you want to do, but you need to test this. So the pre-test is like the first step of this, where you just test the questionnaire on a small scale, just to make sure that, you know, things are going well and you get some initial feedback, revise the instruments again. Then the pilot, this is very critical. So for the pilot, you want to like replicate exactly what you're going to do in the field, exactly the way you would do it, the, the number of team members that you would have, if you're going to do the interview in urban and rural areas, make sure you have urban and rural households you're going to interview so that you can check, you know, where issues are, identify these problems, put them back in, into revising all the instruments that you will need for it, any gaps that you overlooked, you get them during the pilot. So don't skim up a pilot, just do the pilot as well as possible because it saves you a lot, you know, later down the, down the line. And then training. So Brian knows this for training. We don't play around at all. <laughs> We're going to be putting together a group of interviewers to go talk to house. So they are the hardest job of everybody involved in the survey process, in my opinion, because they're the ones that are going to be knocking on doors and asking a bunch of questions that people don't really want to answer. So you have to have really detailed training for them. Make sure that they know about the objectives of the survey, understand why the survey itself is taking place. It, they have a complete understanding of the questionnaires. Sometimes you have 50, 60 page questionnaires. So that means that you need a lot of these to make sure that the enumerators and the supervisors, everybody involved knows the questionnaire really well, understand the terms of concepts in it so that if a household is like, wait, what do you mean? They actually can explain to them so they can get, you know, the respondent to answer properly. They have to be familiar, very familiar with the different models, the flow of the questionnaire, and then they have to learn how to use the tools. If you're using Cathy, the person has to know how to use the tablet. If you need to any measuring board or anything, they have to be able to use it. So even during training, we usually conduct a field practice, have the admirators and supervisors do some mini practice, maybe somewhere around the training center, just to have them go through that process so that, you know, they get more comfortable. And if you have a large number of staff, we always stay to divide the training into two stages, do a training of trainers, and then the trainers train the enumerators. But if you don't have such a large group, you can have this at just one stage of, of training. So it depends on um, how many, I guess, how many houses you're going to visit and how many people, how many interviewers and uh, supervisors you need to train. So the field work, of course, this is the core of it. Everything leads to this. If you've done what you're supposed to do, then this should go relatively smoothly if the pandemic doesn't come in the middle of it, because we've had an experience too where people were in the field and then shut down. But this is the core of the of the um of the survey operations and all the preparation, all the training is to make sure that the field work operations go well and you're able to collect um, high quality data. And you should make sure that everyone is following all the field work monitoring and communication plans because it helps to minimize the um, errors in the field. So quality control. This is, um, even though we have this later in this presentation, it's, I wanted it all to be together, what you do before field work, during field work, and at the end of it. You don't just do quality control at the end of the, of the field work. You have it as part of your entire process. So starting from the beginning, when you're planning, you have to make sure you have a monitoring plan. How are we going to check that the data quality is good? When you have your questionnaires and you design it in CAPI, make sure that validation checks are you know, all through the program. If, if a female should only be answering questions about fertility, you should not get like, all these things are things that you can make sure that is all programmed into the questionnaire that helps to, to check what the interviewers are doing because they're human, there's you know only so much they can do. So if you have a lot of this quality control right in the questionnaire, it helps the flow of it, it makes the job of the interviewer much easier 
and it makes also the respondent's um, job also easier, right? Because there are no mistakes that the interviewer is making. And then during during field work, we thank God for copy because when we when I started in the last semester, we're collecting things on paper. Being able to check data as it's coming in every day, that there's someone in headquarters looking at the data as it's coming in, having a, a monitoring dashboard, and you can actually see some issues and let the enumerators know while they're still in the field that there's a problem before they leave is a game changer. So we always believe that this is this part of this remote monitoring that you're doing from a desk and being able to pass on information immediately really, really helps with you know having good quality data. And of course, when everything is done and you have your entire survey completed, you still do a thorough review, you know, check the flow and accuracy of responses and do some minor data cleaning. We always say you want raw data. You're not trying to change the responses at all, but you know, you still have to make sure that everything flows before you um, you disseminate to the public. And then documentation. So this is one of the things we've been working really closely with the SMAP team on too. You should make sure that everything you are doing is documented from the beginning of the survey process. If team members change, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. They just go back and look at what was done before for the next time you need to do the survey again. And we have something we call a basic information document where you compile everything that you did about the survey. They plan from the beginning what went wrong, how you solved it, so that the next team that's going to work on the survey, maybe three years from then, will be able to use that document and you will, inform, you will inform them, even users of the data, like, wait, why is this this way? They go to the basic information document, they're like, oh, okay, this will happen. So it's really good to document everything that happens in a survey. It's important for users, but also for work that's going to follow later. And then dissemination. So we are always preaching about data should not be kept on somebody's computer. You have to, if people are not using it, there really is, like, you wasted the time of the respondents, you wasted everybody's time. So it should be disseminated. And of course, because we're talking about household survey data, we're talking about micro data, which um, a lot of times on the micro data library is in Stata. And, you know, we work together with brand teams to help people use this data, because I know some people are not very familiar with it, but it's something that we can also support in analyzing micro data. And of course, all the data released should be accompanied with documentation, the basic information document, all the questionnaires, all the manuals, so that when people are using the data, they have the full um, full package. And we also encourage to have a data launch for um, primary and secondary stakeholders if you know you can afford it, because then you want people to know about the data, especially the countries and you know these other stakeholders working in the field, so that they can aware of this data and be able to use it to inform whatever our work um that they are doing. So now to what we've been doing with the SMAP team. So all of the survey process we just described, we've been supporting SMAP working together to, to do this. So we started in 2016 for the MTA of our Energy Survey. We worked with a team in designing the questionnaire. And um, even like we always say, you know, we had this, just to give an example, we had a bunch of firms when the energy survey was first starting, and they know a lot about energy, and they're like submitting proposals, but they know nothing about surveys. I was like, no, you cannot. Like, your energy, you know, knowledge is great, but do you know how to interview a household? Do you know what it takes to put together a team of people to interview a household? So then we decided, okay, we'll have both SMAP and LSMS team on the um Review in terms of reference on the you know team that is looking at the TORs at the firm, the proposals that they that they submit, and be able to get a firm that knows about energy but also knows surveys and can actually do this. So we supported in that. We helped um, with the sampling, questionnaire design, training of the field personnel, developing the CAPI application, quality control, and even reviewing of reports. So I think it's been you know a successful collaboration. And we also, you know, helped in the standalone energy surveys. And because it's great to have the standalone surveys, it's very important to, you know, have a deep dive into, into energy for a country. But also, you want to be able to see how this, the energy indicators relate to other parts of a household welfare. So we started working together on integrating this improved measure into um, national household service, especially the poverty service that um, a lot of countries um, implement. And since a lot of them come across our desk to review within the bank, we always say, okay, look, this is the best, 
you know, version of the energy model that you should have in your questionnaire if you want to be useful for the country. So together with SMAP and WHO, we put together this guidebook to help households and uh, to help countries and other teams within um, the back to integrate an energy model into a um, national household survey that has health, education, and everything else in it. So this is available on our website, but also on your website. And, you know, so if anyone wants to use that. And um, now we are in the second phase of supporting the um, supporting SMAP and working on this collaboration together. And one of the key things that Brian came and his team came to us with is how do we streamline these questionnaires and have a global one that countries can just take and adapt and have this well documented so that when Brian moves on and Dana moves on and people move on somewhere else, there's this, you know, package of instrument that other energy GPT members can use and, and, and work with. So we're harmonizing and designing the questionnaire for cross-country comparability. We're designing a global service solutions um, application, securing and managing a server where all of this will be stored, and then developing data quality monitoring systems that all of them can adapt, and also tools for data cleaning and analysis. And of course, we continue to help integrate these updated questions into nationally representative uh, multi-topic household surveys. And of course, we are still we are doing the next phase of some of the countries are on their second energy surveys now, and we're still supporting that with um, monitoring, training, training. I think we just put this few countries here, but Brian has told us there's going to be much more. <laughs> it's fine. And of course, we are still working together with the team on hiring and supervising the firm. So we are like the eyes above watching the firms, but they're private firms and they have their own objective and as is to make sure that they do a good job and deliver on, on what the bank has hired them to do. So we continue to do that and I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Mimi, for the uh, great presentation on their survey. It has been, yeah, as, as Mimi mentioned, it has been a Great pleasure to work <laughs> with the LSMS team on the development of the MTF and then implementing the MTF survey uh, for the past 25 years. And now we are working on about a seven, eight country right now with the LSMS team to do a new survey uh, in addition to all the work that she already uh, mentioned. So now I want to turn to um, MTF survey. Uh, we have a cat um, on the call, so she's going to introduce the uh, the the structure and the overview of the MTF survey, and then I will take over, and then I will also present about the, uh, in addition to the MTF, how we want to apply the MTF survey and the survey approach to the other energy issue that we want to address, or they're frequently getting the uh, question from the uh, energy operation team, and how we're going to move forward. So um, I want to, uh, over to you, Kat, you want to start the presentation? Yeah, sure. Uh, just give me one second. Hi, I'm Kat. I'm an energy access specialist and I'm a team member of the multi-tier framework team. Just give me one second. Uh, I have some connection issues here. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. There you go. Okay, following the LSMS team's great presentation on the technical aspects of the um, implementing a survey, in this presentation, we will talk more about the value of a survey as a study tool, how energy studies have been conducted using surveys and what implementation challenges there could be when conducting an energy survey. Then we will have a discussion and a Q&A session after the presentation. Um, as the LSMS team showed in the previous presentation, surveys are an effective tool for studies. When performing a study using data, there are three things we need. First, clear study objective. Second, data. And the third, analytical approach or how we want to analyze the data. Sometimes there are data already available. And in that case, it's just a matter of choosing how you want to analyze data for your study but sometimes data just doesn't exist at all, then, in, then it needs to be created and surveys could be used to generate the data. One big advantage of um, survey as a study tool is that it gives the flexibility to choose what information to collect and whom to study. Since what information to collect can be controlled, 
surveys allow project implementers to study their interests more specifically and thoroughly. So many energy studies have been implemented using surveys. Um, key energy studies such as household energy affordability study, electricity demand estimation, um, energy access studies, and off-grid market assessment. All these have been uh, conducted with data generated from energy surveys, examining households, public institutions, enterprises, and more. And the major energy survey that has provided data for such energy studies was the multi-tier framework survey. Um, the multi-tier framework survey, or the MTF survey, is a comprehensive nationwide energy survey. It was carried out in more than 25 countries from 2016. Um, the MTF survey's conceptual foundation is grounded in the multi-tier framework, which is an assessment method to measure access to electricity and clean cooking. While traditional methods measure electricity or energy access in a binary term, having access or not, um, the multi-tier framework measures energy access in a more detailed manner. It measures energy access at six levels from tier zero to tier five, evaluating different attributes of energy supply. As you can see from the table on the top right for electricity access, power capacity, electricity availability, connection reliability, voltage quality, connection formality, and safety, all those are evaluated. And for access to clean cooking, exposure to stove emission, um, cooking preparation, convenience, fuel availability, fuel affordability, and safety are the key attributes uh, based on the MTF. In the MTF survey, those attributes of energy supply are captured through survey questions, as you can see from the examples on this slide. So responses to these survey questions become the data that enables analyzing energy access. And in addition to the key aspects of energy access, the MTF survey collects a wide range of information related to energy. Um, the information is collected through component surveys of the MTF survey, examining households, public schools and hospitals, enterprises, and also off-grid markets. Uh, starting with the household survey, the household survey is the most extensive survey compared to all other component surveys. It collects a huge amount of energy data and background contextual data and allows different disaggregated analysis. I brought here a snapshot of what is covered in the household survey. Um, to start with the energy data, um, to understand electricity access, information like households main source of electricity, electricity consumption and spending, and use of other lighting sources and backup power sources is collected through this household survey. Um, sometimes households run a small business within their house, and those household businesses' electricity access is also captured through this survey. Um, the survey also gathers data on households' access to clean cooking services. The survey asks about households' primary method of cooking, cook stove stacking, uh, cooking fuel, cooking behavior, environment, and more. And lastly, the survey also collects information on households' fuel use for cooking, electricity, heating, or any other purposes and also uh, willingness to pay for the grid, off-grid solar solutions and improved cook stoves of uh, those without those uh, technologies. And in addition to the energy information, background information to understand households are also collected, such as information about household head, household members, like their sex, age, education level, employment, and so. Data on household wealth and contextual information are also uh, covered by this survey. Now I'll uh, now Brian will explain how these data have been used for studies and go through the rest of the presentation. All right, thank you so much. So I mean, as uh, as Kat mentioned, uh, we are working on the MTF survey, and then whenever we do an MTF survey, we can see some gap between the traditional approach, like when we are measuring the energy access in terms of binary indicator and the MTF, we can see uh, some of difference. And also recently, I had a chance to review the uh, Lebanon uh, MTF survey data and then the result like report. Quite strikingly, um, I think even for those who are connected to grid, they are still in the uh, tier zero, which means that many of the grid connected households 
who do not have a less than like a less than four hours of electric supply per day, as a result, they are in tier zero, even though they have a grid connection because of some economic crisis and so on. So MTF provided such a great idea and the great information on the granularity in terms of energy access, not just based on the access to uh, technology, but based on the quality of electric supply they're getting from either on grid or off grid. So regardless of their technology, we are looking at the, what kind of service service they can get. And then we are getting a lot of uh, requests. Since uh, we are the one that who are working on the survey and who are mainly dealing with the uh, micro data, we are getting some of the uh, some interesting questions. How can we uh, measure the affordability? We are working on the uh, result based finance or the individual subsidy. How what should be the optimal level level of the subsidy that, that we have to design? And then based on the affordability angle, so first either we're going to look into the uh, their current expenditure spending. So the first one, analyze spending on a lighting, lighting source other than electricity, and then try to see what is their revealed preference based on the other source of electricity, uh, other lighting source and expenditure. We try to estimate how much they are willing to pay for the uh, new technology or the new solution that we're going to offer. And then second, we also apply the some of energy poverty like a baseline. I mean, our energy poverty threshold like five percent or ten percent. And then we we have question. Uh, we and then we ask ourselves whether we are in the position to tell whether this is affordable or not. Like a five percent, six percent. This is a threshold that we can apply to the uh, rural community in the in the African context. And then we try to apply, the, we try to look into the other methodology, like some of demand estimation and from the economic literature, we try to see what we can do is that we can observe whether people are adopting certain technology or not, but we cannot tell whether this is affordable or not. So using the some econometric uh, approach to answer to this question. At the same time, we also explore the, uh, the use of application of the contingent valuation method or willingness to pay module. So, for example, grid connection, we work with the uh, Kenneth Lee from the UC Berkeley to design with this module. But I think we're going to do more of the uh, such uh, experimentation, as Mimi mentioned, as a team working a lot on the, uh, like the tool development and the methodology development. So probably that's another area that we can work together to develop the, uh, such an uh, approach, like a contingent valuation, not only for the grid connection, but also to the other sector. We already have one, but we can also keep working on it. So that's one uh, one area that we got we get a lot of a question and that we try to extend and apply to this uh, certain topic. Like the first one is the affordability assessment or the demand assessment using the micro data and then um, the energy survey data. Uh, Kat, next one. And also um, energy access. We always say that our energy access is not the end goal, but means to the other end. Especially, we want to see that we're gonna uh, contribute to the economic development and then improving the, their livelihood. So, access to electricity at that residential customer is pretty critical uh, for them. Like uh, having solar lantern also means a lot to them, and then maybe they are more likely to move on to the uh, along the energy ladder. But at the same time, in terms of the economic impact. The, the role of enterprise is going to be a uh, pretty inevitable and then very essential. So we, uh, with the uh, support from the Rockefeller Foundation, we carried out the enterprise survey in uh, a certain number of the country for the first time. And then also uh, in, in the context of the uh, productive use of energy. So we can also target the off-grid uh, off uh, off enterprise, but at the same time, we are also looking into the on-grid and the former enterprise. And then try to understand first what is the access status, and also we want to see how much electricity and the backup source they are consuming. In Somalia, for example, enterprise survey data collected by the enterprise survey team shows that are more than 15 percent. I mean, majority of them are connected to grid, but still, like more than 15 or the 20 percent of the enterprise are relying on the uh, diesel generator to produce. Um, I mean, the supply electricity because of the other. Uh, the reliability issue, mainly reliability. Reliability is one of the uh, big bottleneck for the enterprise to actually um, purchase more appliance or maximize their use of electricity. And also, we try to look at the uh, then um, affordability the for, from the enterprise perspective. And then we also want to see whether kind of they are willing to pay for more to improve uh, for the improved reliable uh, reliable electricity supply from the grid utility or the. Uh, or other like off-grid solar solution or the, the mini grid. 
And also as a result, we can also take a look at the uh, some of our carbon emission from the diesel generator. If they have a better quality of electric supply, then they don't need to spend a lot of money on the diesel, and then maybe they're gonna reduce the use of the diesel as a result. We can also estimate and then calculate the uh, some of carbon emission from that uh, perspective. So we also work on the enterprise survey and the Kotami has been leading the, uh, this uh, enterprise survey questionnaire development and also like a methodology. And also we're going to do the enterprise survey for the next, I mean, uh, some, uh, many of the country for the next round as well. Uh, next. And then another, another issue, I mean, another idea that we had and OK, we're going to do the uh, NPF survey. And, and I can see that some of our partners from the private sector also joined the, uh, today's DBL. Um, so in South Sudan, OK, we're going to do the uh, demand side survey and the demand side assessment. I know South Sudan is quite a challenging environment to carry out the uh, survey, um, given that they have there's no sensors and so on, and then the transportation is pretty challenging. But while we are doing a demand assessment, what about also doing this on supply side assessment so we can come up with a more comprehensive understanding? OK, when we are doing a survey, we can we can get some more idea from the demand side and the user uh, about the affordability or their perception or awareness toward a certain technology and so on. But at the same time, supply side, they may um, have a different idea why, uh, how we can scale up the uh, off-grid solar solution in country and so on. So in South Sudan, we did a, for the first time, we, we did a, like a supply side and a demand side um, study in one, one report. And then we try to apply to the other country. So whenever like an energy team working on the uh, demand side survey, they can also have some good ideas, supply side um, assessment. One of the reasons why I tr we try to incorporate the supply side study, whenever we are working on the survey, we need to do the uh, survey, I mean, the survey preparation and the customization of the questionnaire. In this process, we have to reach out to the market and then we need to identify that on supply side, getting the list of the product and so on. So probably we can also incorporate all the information that gathered by the, our uh, private partner into the report that can provide a more insight, kind of qualitative insight. So we did it in South Sudan and also in Sierra Leone with the support from the CCF, um, Michelle and then Jimmy, and I think Ali is also part of the team. We did a market assessment for the clean cooking, I mean, cooking a uh, cook stove market assessment. We did a end user survey, like a demand side survey, and at the same time supply side assessment, and then we put it together as a one market assessment report, focusing on the like a stove market in Sierra Leone. And there was also pretty, with approach that we can have a comprehensive understanding between the both from the supply and um, and demand side. So we try to also apply to the other country where we're gonna do the MTF survey. I know um, I, we have a private partners on the call having more work to collect the good quality of information from the supply side. But um, yeah, I think they're gonna be pretty uh, useful and beneficial to the energy team and also our um, client. Next. So these are the most frequently um, asked question. Um, so first, uh, what we saw is that, um, okay, we want to do a survey, but many of the operation team, they have uh, some of the concern. This is too complex or it, it's too hassle to design the survey or the implementing a survey. Um, or sometimes they feel like uh, they are focusing more on the energy topic. So not necessarily really like uh, focusing on the survey part and, as um, Mimi uh, pointed out, so they didn't bring the uh, survey expert in the very initial stage of the uh, of designing the study. As a result, I saw there some technical proposal uh, from the uh, the consultant or there some data collection done by the uh, our um, our colleagues. I can see a lot of bias just looking at the GPS code name. It all collected from the uh, the center of the uh, village. What I can imagine is that people are going to go to the village. They're gonna sitting in the under the tree. And then they're gonna do the interview among the several uh, several people whom they can meet, and then collect the data. So when you look at the GPS coordinate, each of the village all coming from the uh, one cent, almost like a center road, <laughs> uh, because it's better transportation. You can get to the, uh, the the center of the village, and then you just sit there and then talk to the people and the collecting information, and then you're gonna um, uploading on the server. So. 
and I, I cannot see any of the methodology and so on. So I think it's really important that um, um, the, the, the such as complexity, we if we don't really address the such a complexity of the methodology itself, we're gonna get the uh, very highly skewed or the biased data. For example, we estimate the uh, sum of number from the data collected from the other center. Maybe they are more richer people, like a richer people than the other boundary. When we estimate the overall like a demand of the village or the cluster, of course, there will be some upward bias. I don't know how much it is critical to the design of the system, but for sure what I can tell is that there is upward bias. And also um, it's not easy to uh, harmonize the timeline between the, the operation team and the survey timeline. So that's another thing that we always um, um, getting the kind of, uh, I mean, concerning and then the, the struggling with. And then third, also, okay, MTF team, you're gonna come and do the one-time survey and then you're gonna leave. What about the second one? Can you do the second survey? And also another challenge that I can see from the uh, working with the operation team, operation team is just facing that, okay, Thank you so much for providing a data. Okay, this is, it looks good. It, it looks like a good quality of data, but how can we use it? I mean, as I mentioned, energy team, we have expertise more on the, uh, the energy issue, but sometimes we don't have a very kind of strength in dealing with the micro data or the cross-sectional data or the panel data. And nowadays we, are, we want to more look into the demand side perspective or the consumer behavior. Compared to um, previously, we are more into the like supply oriented like approach. Now people want to more look into the consumer and the demand side, but sometimes we don't have a, such a good capacity in-house. So we work with the firm, they provide the survey completion report. Even if we have some idea, okay, we want to look into this idea, more like disaggregate by the certain like a subset and so on, but sometimes it's too much hassle. Next. So how are we gonna support? So first, um, as Mimi mentioned, we are gonna strengthen our collaboration with the LSMS team for sure. And uh, we also wanna inform, I mean, work with the uh, NRS team to design, I mean, to involve us in the, in the stage of designing the project as early as possible. So we can provide a full support. For example, it's not just working, we, we cannot just go to the country and we're gonna collect the data. We need to coordinate with the public practice and the statistical office. And then as, as uh, Mimi mentioned, sensitization is really important for the, also like the safety of the other building. So it's pretty complex, as complex like a task. So we can help the energy team to be involved in the, uh, the process as early as possible and that we can support them. And also, as we mentioned, like we are working on the streamlining. According to our estimation, we should be able to complete everything within nine months. And in Rwanda, we, we were able to complete everything except for the uh, procurement six months. So I think there is a, I mean, there is a way that we can expedite the process. For sure, some of them to the country, we spent three years or four years, even five years. We spent five years to do the survey, like survey preparation, three years. And then like an implementation delay and so on. And then it took like a four or five years to complete the survey. I, I know there, there is just some of case that we also delay the process, but if we can organize, streamline everything and then, um, I mean, very, I mean, so there is a there is a way that we can also expedite, and then we have some of a couple of examples we can complete everything within nine months or eight months in that timeline, and also um, the the follow up survey in Rwanda we did a follow up survey and we found that it's quite useful and informative to understand the, the actual like the progress and that sometimes we can see informal uh, off grid and on grid and so on. For that, we need a lot of support from the uh, the Minister of Energy to work with the statistical office to integrate more of the energy module into the National House Survey. For sure, LSMS team can play a pivotal and then the critical role, but energy team, it is pretty critical to have the support from the energy team and also other development partners in the country so they can work together to add the statistical office to integrate more questions into the survey. And then the ministry and the government can also benefit from the such um, addition. And then data analysis. So that's why MTF team working with LSMS team, and also we have some colleagues from the Dime and also our Academia, um, um, and also private partner. We are working on the various topics like affordability and also PUE from the enterprise survey perspective and the market assessment for cooking and off-grid sector, and also we support yes, our pre-feasibility study for the mini grid and so on. So we're gonna work on keep working on the data analysis 
and uh, the methodology and the framework, and then we try to expedite, I mean, at least to facilitate the such a process um, for the operation team. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's also um, what we can offer. I think that's the end of the presentation, right? OK, thank you so much. And since we have a lot of colleagues here in, in the uh, I building and also online, so I want to use this opportunity to um, also get a lot of insight. And especially we have um, Dana and also we have a Michelle online. So Dana has been, I mean, Dana led the uh, MTF team a while ago. So pretty recently, I, I guess. Long time ago. <laughs> We are very yeah. young, all of us. <laughs> yeah, so I want to ask some question about the uh, um, kind of role of the MTF data in the operation. I mean, since we are, I'm, I'm working at SMAP and the global unit, we are supporting the operation team. Sometimes it's not very clear to see how the operation team actually using the MTF, MTF data for their project design and so on. So I want to hear from you about yeah, the role of MTF data. And then second, also, since uh, Dana, you are leading the, the regional MPA and uh, Ascent program, and so many of the regional initiatives as well, like the electrifying PASA, how MTF team can also support the, such a scale of efforts, and then what would be the area that we can um, collaborate even further? So these are the two questions to Dana. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Brian. So it's it's really great to see how you know that um, basically the NPF uh, continues being um, the um, a very useful tool that uh, that um, that it's very much demanded, right, by the operational teams as well. So where I see this is really useful is often obviously the most useful when we're engaging. Uh, on energy access, especially if we're uh, engaging uh, the first time, but also when we're designing new operations, because we never have good, um, complete sense of what's happening on the ground. We do have some SDG7 data, right, that gives you the electrification rate, uh, that is often an approximation. Um, increasingly, uh, maybe as uh, you guys manage to integrate more data into into the, the national service, we'll have uh, we'll have better data on um, on the sort of nuances of it. But it's the really the nuances that the NTF can provide. So it's both understanding on the grid and and off grid side, and um, often you get quite a lot of surprises, right, when you look into that. Uh, What's actually a grid rate? What's actually the upgrade rate? And and then on the upgrade rate, right, how much of that is actually both tier service uh, are being provided so that we actually get a sense, right? The population is really served by at least tier one, or is it all under the tier one, or is it all, you know, being served? But from the nuances, you find out that there is really lots of issues with with the performance of the system. So. The same thing on the grid, right? In, in, in many of our operations, we are looking into improving uh, reliability and uh, we do have information from the utilities about, in some cases better, some cases worse, about, you know, outages, availability, uh, uh, shortages, where there are shortages of generation, but then getting that from the demand side validates, right? Whether, whether, or, or can, not, not just validate, but basically can point where if things are not matching, right? And there is an issue somewhere and you can sort of start looking into that. So so the, the, the nuances of it and also like what's very useful, um, obviously, uh, Brian, you mentioned it, is um, the, the information about any kind of proxies on affordability and both affordability in, in the sense of, you know, like what will the household be able to pay or willing to pay? And yeah, then more difficult question is, does that mean it's affordable? But maybe that's sort of also important, but really the most important, right? Are you, if you're designing a program, are you designing your connections, for example, for the grid at the level that the household will connect? Because if not, then, you know, there is no point. And, and there is also lots of information there that I found always useful, that it's sort of quantitative 
objective information, but even the subjective information that comes from the service when you ask household why they're not connected. And sometimes you get interesting insights. I remember in Ethiopia, right? It was not so much the affordability of connections that had come up, it was just the sort of the utility was not connecting people, right? The MS started barriers, and it was really the key insight that went into the design of the densification program there, right? To be faster, to be able to to reach out people uh, faster. So, so I think I think all of that basically gender, right, is another one. And uh, I know Michelle will be talking about cooking. So I mean, the cooking is the whole area, similar way, right? I'm talking more about electricity, but similar, similar on the cooking, and on the gender, right? We uh, we you know we increasingly have or trying to develop right the targeted. Um, interventions to, to 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 address gender. So without these these nuances of understanding how maybe um uh female not just female in the household but also on the enterprises, right? Female female enterprises, what are the additional barriers that they're facing and so on. So you can you can get quite a lot already, right? So looking into into the different parts of the questions of, of these different uh, different questionnaires. Mm -hmm. On um, the, the the enterprise, I think this will be still, and maybe that's sort of been moving. Okay, uh, maybe I'll leave it for moving forward, right? What what we will need. Um, I think moving forward, I think that there will be several things. One of them is that now that we have the target that our president announced of 250 million people with electricity access in Africa. Um, I think we will need more continuous information just to get a sense how well we are doing, not just to deliver these, these, these targets, but also are we really delivering the acceleration of energy access that we're trying to achieve is that. So I think what would be interesting to look into are two things, right? One is where are we successful in the integration, right, of these questions into the household service and making sure that we actually know the data is there or it's coming that the teams know when the survey is happening, what data there will be. Um, and the other one, right, maybe if you can think of um, some quicker ways of follow-up service, maybe phone service, just to get some basic information to see are things changing, right, and what in which way they're changing in terms of is the off-grid being accelerated, is it uh, grid that's being accelerated, uh, um, so I think that's sort of one area that would be good to think about. Yeah, the, the other areas are sort of the, the more new areas that we're trying to do more. I think productive use is one of them. And I think we're still trying to figure out what are uh, the right types of interventions to the productive use. And it also depends on what kind of productive use you want to support. Is it more agriculture? Is it more small businesses? And so I think where what would be useful is to continue sort of thinking through how this enterprise survey could be maybe um, adapted to different kinds of needs, right? So in some cases, it may be the need may be exactly to identify what are those enterprises that are using diesel now that could actually be taken out of diesel and what would it take, right? So it can be uh, an input into identification of sites for mini grids because we know that these types of enterprises are, you know, in certain areas that you know the, the mini grids may be more viable. But also now on the off-grid solar because you have much uh, larger systems that can actually cost-effectively display, displace diesel, right? So, so, so sort of understanding, right, where where what are these enterprises maybe at the starting point, right, that could get out of diesel and electricity. Uh, and and then also, right? What with obviously, what are the others that are not, and uh, what what kind of affordability support they would they would be needing? But I think it will need some. It will probably need some prior work. To just get a sense, right, of of the types of enterprises to focus on, and maybe do something more focused. Because if you do across uh, across all the enterprises it's quite interesting but it's very difficult to pinpoint anything after that like yeah. okay, what is your intervention mm. so so that i think would be 
will be good uh, good continued work. Um, I think that continue continued work is on you know improving generally demand assessments, right? Uh, how can we use the, the the MPF and other tools to get better sense of uh, what what will be the demands and people and enterprises that are trified. And I was quite intrigued. I didn't realize you did the supply side service in some kind. So that would be interesting to look into whether and how uh, this, this can be maybe more mainstream. Uh, obviously, there is it, it has complexity as well, right? Because as you need the, the right household survey firm to do the household service, right? You also need probably sort of someone who is more familiar with the with the with the sector and uh, and to, to do the the supply side uh, properly to avoid the bias also on the supply side right so they don't just talk to the enterprises we know but how do we identify we don't know and so on so but would be would be I agree with you that sort of there are probably efficiencies of of linking it together yeah. um, so I would be quite interested at some point to to have a discussion how um, how how that has been done and whether we can sort of mainstream it more. So those are just some reflections. Thank you so much, Tana. Yeah, so before I respond, I mean, so I will I will also move on to uh, cooking. I mean, before having another discussion on the electricity. So I think Michelle is online. Michelle, are you there? So Michelle is leading the Clean Cooking Fund at SMAP. And then um, we've been working a lot with uh, Michelle on the cooking agenda too. Um, so MTF team has been, we have a history to work with the uh, CCF team for a while. So Michelle, um, similar question, but I think cooking sector, I believe that um, cooking sector has a more, more severe issue with the uh, data. I mean, in terms of the absence of the data, at least like electricity, we have some question from the household survey, but in terms of the cooking, even we don't know what type of stove they're using. So I just wanted to, uh, ask one question related to the role of MTF data for the cooking project operation and then your work. And also, um, I just want to ask what would be the, the kind of collaboration that we're going to have in the in the future for the next round of the MTF survey and also not only about the MTF, but also other like a data and analytic work that we can work together. Uh, Misha, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can hear you. Over to you. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much. That's, uh, yeah, data and data-based uh, analysis is really close to my heart. So I'm happy to be here and hearing all the, the work uh, um, in the other areas and how this has been pushed out. I think the, the main contribution of the MTF on clean cooking, but not just on clean cooking, is that you change the mindset from the infrastructure or the stove to the service. So you, you have different elements and it's changed why. Maybe we can say that, you can say, look, the importance is the service, but if you don't have the data, you don't have the definition to say, so uh, it's empty. So the MTF really allow us to to look on the operations and looking on the goals and the target on the countries, looking on the service that arrived to the user. So I think that's that's the main uh, contribution. And I come, yeah, I, I'm new in the World Bank and I come from other multilateral agents. And this is one of the biggest challenge we have when you think about service. So I think MTF has this big, bring this big advantage to the World Bank and to the others, because in the countries where we have this information, we can actually say what does it mean, uh, clean cooking service. Or, and just to give you an example, one that I have to my uh, clear uh, in, in my mind that I, I'm, I'm Brazilian, right? And in Brazil, you may say that just if you look on the household survey and the WHO data, you may say that around 4% of the population does not have access to clean cooking, just 4%. And then when you look on the consumption level of the household on biomass, you have more than 25% of the household consumption is biomass. And Brazil is not for heating. So you have a big 
it's really unclear what means clean cooking when you look on the Brazilian case because we don't know what actually people is using to cook uh, and what does it mean access to cook and that's it's a big example because you're talking about millions of people that do, we we don't have the information so when you think about the program and the government there right now it's struggling with that they are thinking about how can i do a program for clean cooking but first we need to understand what's the problem because our data does not give us the information. So I think that this brings an example that how we, when you have the data of the MTF, we can say what people is actually used to cooking, what are the population, the different uh, um, socioeconomic and demographic of the population, and it allows us to think about a program that can solve the different challenges because it can be and probably is stacking and affordability the issue, not the issue about having access to uh, stove. So it allows us to actually frame the, the questions about the service, not just a number about, yeah, people at one moment achieved, let's say, was able to use a clean cooking stove, they actually have access to clean cooking. So I think that's the core of the main, uh, of the main contribution and do we, what you, the clean cooking fund used this for design main of the, the, the different operations that the, the bank uh, has proposed. Um, just at, at the clean cooking fund, we have uh, uh, 10 RTFs and most of them were based, uh, the, the baseline was based on the MTF. So that's, I think, a, a quite important uh, element uh, when you think about clean cooking and the challenge on clean cooking which, uh, as as you mentioned, it's still we still have more lack of information uh, on clean cooking for different reasons, as invisibility and also because even the definition uh, sometimes is is a little bit more challenging because of the stacking process that we can see on cooking, and that's one of the challenges and the analysis that we need to. Uh, go deeper uh, in the future with the MTF team and it's in our uh, work plan for the next fiscal years and also another element that I think it would be really important is especially as we see that when you think about cooking as a as a as a, this uh, potential to include cooking a part of electricity access so you see the energy access as the new business plan of the desmap where we start to think more energy access together electricity and cooking as much as possible let's say and when you think about planning for instance we want to include cooking as part of the planning we will need to think more about how we integrate both database and be really able to look for household how they combine the different energy service that they have so that's something we need to be working more together to be able to do energy service analysis of the household uh, level, especially if you want to start to do thinking about the planning, I think the MTF can bring the added value because we're able to better understand the, the points, let's say, uh, and how it evolves. Uh, um, that's one point. Um, another point that I want to underline is that uh, on clean cooking, most of the case, we don't have a clean cooking operations, as everybody here knows. We have clean cooking component on other kind of operations. We have energy access, for instance, where this uh, uh, this uh, joint approach will be important, but also we have uh, operation with forest, with social protection, with clean air program. So that's another um, potential and another strength of the of the MTF because it allows us to bring other variables to the analysis, not just the energy sector by itself, but allow us to do this cross information, which help us in the dialogue. Uh, with our counterparts in other sectors. I think that's also important and something that we need to move a little bit deeper. And one of the examples that we are doing the first uh, MTF that we include um, um, the PM 2.5 as part of this work with a uh, clean air program. I think that's the kind of thing we will be seeing more um, how to include and bring together the different um, needed of information and uh, cross-sector work. And also because there is uh, this 
uh, demand uh, that we see each time more on looking on operations, not just in terms of output, but in terms of outcome, right? There is this push for outcome based. Uh, and for this, we really need a good baseline, not just about the, 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 the cooking itself, but the relationship of the cooking with the other variables that's associated with the social economic that we want to improve. So that's something also uh, we believe that to be uh, kind of important. Uh, and another uh, part, I think Donna already, um, I have already commented on that, but the productive use, that's up where I think we need to move forward. In the case of cooking, we still have much less information than electricity. We see an increasing demand on that, and we need to work together even to define well what we're calling a productive use of cooking because you have some stoves, for instance, for ceramic. This is cooking or, you know, you have a lot of things there we need to, to think together. Um, and also the institutional cooking. That's another part that will be, we already start to work on this one. We have a little bit more information on that, but I think there is a lot of a room for information. And uh, last but not least that you already also mentioned the importance that to start to cross database. What I mean by that, one thing that would be really important is that if you're able, for instance, to cross electricity and uh, fuel uh, information database with uh, the MTF. So we can try to do some analysis, including uh, this kind of element when you think about subsidies or when you think about social protection programs, how we cross this database that some of them, they already exist. Uh, and uh, when you talk about air pollution as well, there is a database on air pollution. So we need to start to work a little bit more about how to across this database to, to take the most of it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love the agenda and we will be working together, but this is some of the points I, I want to raise. All right, thank you so much, Misha. Yeah, so we've been working with the uh, also clean cooking tile a lot. So as, as Michelle mentioned, also like in addition to the MTF survey, what we can also do is that we can also ex extract the uh, more information from the existing house of survey data. For example, we can identify uh, more the economic, I mean, electricity expenditure, fuel expenditure from the existing database. Sometimes that's the information that the team is looking for, but it's not economically makes sense that in order to extract one information, they have to work with the uh, raw data set. So that's also something that um, at the MTF or the SMF team can support, come up with the one big database to support the operation team to um, to pull out the uh, some of the insight from there. And I think Dan also mentioned about the enterprise survey. So I think, um, Gotami, you can also briefly um, introduce a little bit about the enterprise survey that we are working on. And then I think also affordability study. So, you know, in a, I mean, it's not really like affordability, but we try to address the uh, the, the optimal like a subsidy level. Then probably we can also work with the individual subsidy lab in SMF to actually um, think about how we're gonna interpret. But I think uh, Pei, if you can um, introduce a little bit about the methodology briefly, how you're gonna address the, this affordability issue, um, and then I will op I will open the floor to the uh, all of um, participants to to ask any question. So. So on the enterprise survey thing, this is something we started with. We done pilots in a few countries, and based on that, we kind of figure out what were what things. We did a nationally representative survey, so I think as Dana mentioned, we need a little more thinking through as to what kind of enterprises we need to actually look at whether it's service sector, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's agri processing, all of those things. Uh, so that's something which we're still sort of figuring out what we need to do. But what we've done based on the pilot is we've sort of tried to uh, revise the questionnaire because we had a very long questionnaire, which in some cases did not work very well uh, when we were doing the survey on the ground because not many people, first of all, it's too long and people don't have that kind of time to respond. And the other thing is some of the questions we asked were probably not very easy for them to answer. For instance, revenue. Uh, I mean, we need that information, but it's the way we have to ask to get the right information so that we, so we were trying, we we're trying to 
revise the questionnaire based on that. And now we were trying to figure out the whole sampling part, which uh, ideally we still want to do a nationwide survey. And but the thing is with sectors to focus on and how will it help the project teams and all of those kind of things. So this is something we're still uh, trying to work out. Uh, the thing is, the data can be very useful. So we can do a lot of studies based on, like again, uh, where where are the grid, off grid, demand, all of those things, affordability. What is it that enterprises actually lack, and uh, use of backup sources, which is a huge issue in most uh, places, and how uh, if that's something we can. Uh, like do a mini grid assessment or off grid solar assessment that would be helpful. So this is something we're still working on. Uh, as of now, we're trying to do enterprise surveys in Ethiopia uh, yeah, and yeah. Namibia. So, and now this, <clears throat> whoever like want to do the MTF survey, always they want to include the enterprise survey. So I think they have a huge interest in their PUE, mm -hmm. and then but, they try to figure out the, what kind of analytic framework to come up with the, some project idea. And then they also know that we don't have much data on the, this air sector. So they want to do the enterprise survey. But as you mentioned, sometimes, so, so we need to clarify the sector, which sector we're going to target it and all the size. In, in terms of the large size of um, economy, very small portion. So I don't think that we, we're going to go with a random selection, very small portion. So what we are trying to do from the uh, MTF, previous MTF enterprise survey, and then the existing enterprise survey data shows that um, at least what we can see is that a former sector and then um, manufacturing sector, at least compared to the service sector, they are more relying on the electricity consumption, the electricity source. They consume more electricity, spending more on the energy expenditure compared to service. So now we are trying to also look at the, the manufacturing sector as one target group. And then some of the country, they have a special interest in their hoteling sector as a separate group, but that depending on their country context. And then agriculture survey. I look at the, uh, the ISA survey done by the, uh, the, the LSMS team, Integrated Survey on Agriculture. And then we did a survey in Uganda. I think questionnaire is fine, but more importantly, like a sampling strategy. Who are we going to interview? So agriculture survey, what we concluded from the, the, our study in Uganda is that uh, instead of targeting the, uh, the smallholder farmer, what about targeting the uh, big agriculture, like a cooperative, which has more than 1,000 smallholder farmer as a member, or the, uh, the, the ag aggregator, like an agriculture product, like aggregator. If we want to focus on the product side, the production side, then maybe that's the better like a sample. Otherwise, the rural population, it's really hard to do the sample. And as a, as a result of the uh, interviewing, like a survey, I found that like 97% of farmers are pretty homogeneous. No irrigation, uh, very traditional input and so on. So I, that's that's also what we are working on, like agriculture and the enterprise survey, as um, Tommy mentioned, and then try to come up with some analytic framework so we can inform, we can provide more information to the operation. But I think in this process, we need to have some more input from the operation team and the regional team on how we want to. I think, I think it's a little bit, uh chicken and egg, right? Because I think the problem is that like in the operations, we want to support productive use. We don't have much data, so we don't really know how to support the productive use. But then as a result, we also don't know what data right, we, we need because we really don't know which productive use to support and how to do it. And so I think it may have to be a little bit of <laughs> maybe over time, we'll get, uh, we'll get better in there. But I think it's very uh, not just country specific, but project specific as well. So I think it would be really important to sort of drill down what is this project trying to do in which which areas is this? Is it intervening? Is it grid? Is it off grid? Right? Many grids so are other specific areas because if it's grid, and I think it's what you have said, right? Looking into maybe more formal enterprises, manufacturing, what other areas were reliable electricity, right? And the uh, grid extension really can make difference. If it's on the on the upgrade side, and again, if it's mini grid, you would want to look in the some of the agriculture processing, uh, but also the small services, right? The the the, the, the workshops, the 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 the, the hair salons, the the you know the, yeah. the services right. that are available, restaurants, uh, and and then if it's if it's upgrade, then I, yeah, then then it's the question, right? And again, is it the uh, 
more focused on solar water pumping and so on, and again, how do we identify the right uh, uh, types of <laughs> farmers that sort of could benefit yeah. from that? Uh, is it more, again, the, the sort of uh, um, diesel replacement, right, for mm -hmm. the for the businesses. So I think I think we need to sort of spend time to understand mm -hmm. better with the with the teams where they see that the, the project could have impact and then yeah. and then and then basically target uh, target um, accordingly. So I think it will vary a lot project by project, country by country. Mm -hmm. But from that, I think maybe we could start getting some pattern, right? Yeah, and then. Keep improving so now what I get. Oh, this looks like what we did there, but we we didn't include this this group, and maybe this group should be included as well. And yeah, I think over time we should we should get it right, but I think it will take some experimenting. Yeah, Michelle, I saw your hands up. Over to you, Michelle. Just to complement and going exactly the same line and give an example, for instance, right now in Nepal, there is this uh, demand on especially on productive use of cooking and especially e-cooking. So it, when you talk about that, you are already constrained to a group of, of people and a group of productive use. And I think we can, uh, as I, re I really like what Dana said, look a little bit what you have done on this, uh, even if it's case studies and specific case, and try to figure out from this what are the key elements, let's say, for different kind of countries, let's say. Uh, and I, I think in this way we could work, yeah, a little bit in the same way, but in parallel on the cooking side as well. Sounds good. And, and also, Michelle, regarding the, the institutional cooking, so we have a public institution survey questionnaire, and as you know, and then probably we can also do the more like separate public institution survey, more like representative sample. So that's what uh, we are also planning to do and then see how it come and work. Instead of like household targeting, we try to come up with a public institution from the uh, Minister of Health and the Minister of Education and then try to uh, estimate the, uh, the energy demand, like uh, whether they have a solar panel already in place or not and uh, how many students and how if they have a DJ or not. We try to also estimate the uh, such a the demand from the public institution survey and then for sure I will need your input, uh, Michelle, to uh, finalize the, the question for the public institution part. Um, and then, yeah. yeah. Hey, you want to briefly touch upon the affordability study that uh, you're working on? And then, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, I can briefly explain uh, about the methodology for the affordability and uh, maybe uh, the information we can provide uh, from the result uh, from that methodologist. So um, uh, we actually reviewed all the academic journals about the energy demand models. So we uh, try to, uh, so, so first of all, affordability definition was very broad. So we try to re redefine using the uh, economics uh, concepts of so uh, from the reviewing the journal, we find that there are some methodologies uh, we can apply for to address the affordability issues. So, so uh, we try to incorporate the uh, demand uh, models uh, from the economics. Uh, first uh, methodology using the, uh, the connection price data, uh, we can uh, uh, address uh, some the information of how the uh, households uh, connection choice changes uh, response to the changes of the connection price. So uh, that's the first one. The, the second one is the willingness to pay module. And uh, this, uh, we think this is a quite important uh, methodology because uh, one of the problem of the first methodology is that we cannot apply this method to the off-grid region because they don't have price information because they don't have access to the grid. So uh, the second method we can apply for that region to uh, estimate uh, what are the percentage of the households kind of willing to uh, connect if we provide access to access to that specific region or national representative. So through this data, uh, we can provide uh, 
what kind, what percentage of people gonna connect uh, at different price level. So from that, we can discuss more about the price change, and we can also investigate uh, what are the policy, uh, what kind of policy, especially for the price policy like a sub subsidies, we have to provide. And another aspect is we can also uh, investigate how this uh, connection rate is going to change with the different price price schemes. So, for example, we can provide with a more time period for the payment, like a three months or six months, one year. <clears throat> Actually, we found that <clears throat> the connection rate will increase with the uh, uh, different price schemes more time period if we give more time period for the payment and uh, the, fine, the the last thing uh, we think this is a, a great model is that uh, this model is actually uh, validated from the uh, paper Brian mentioned from the Kenneth Lee uh, 2017 uh, and actually the met, uh, MTF survey data uh, has uh, already included this method and we are now uh, trying to apply this model to the Ethiopia uh, operation project. And uh, this is not, I, I think this is not uh, only for the grid connection. We can expand uh, this model to uh, other affordability issues for cooking or solar. So uh, we think this uh, method has a lot of potentials. So we try to apply the this. I mean, we already have done already know that we have all the like affordability and the willingness to pay in order for the grid and of course solar and the cooking. So first we try to also explore yeah, some other approach or the methodology for the <coughs> contingent valuation or the willingness to pay module. That was one thing. And also second, the economic metric analysis, as Tay mentioned, in terms of the price elasticity and the income elasticity. What we what I want to do is that we want to apply this methodology also to the existing database. I think Michelle and I have been working on the, this uh, the database using the existing household budget survey or the income and expenditure survey data. And then maybe we can apply that such a methodology to the existing database. And then probably we can also provide some insight. Because sometimes we don't have any information to come up with as a reference point to determine the, the optimal so we come up with some uh, random number, sometimes like 50 percent, we can subsidize based on the some of the qualitative study. So we try to provide some reference number for the operation team, and then they can also play with the number and the database to uh, to inform the to have an informed decision or the discussion with the client and the government. It's going to be also same applied to the uh, your work on the clean cooking um, of um, through the MTF survey. Um, so we have uh, one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not going to have a lot of time to discuss, but any any question like one minute? <laughs> yeah, too ambitious to have a yeah. one minute question and then answer to your question. Yeah, OK, thank you so much. So we're going to also share the other recorded um, the BBL and also we're going to share the presentation slides. Uh, with everyone, so you guys can um, take a look and then let me know if you have any question or any clarification needed. Then please send an email to me or the any of the SMS team or the LSMS team, and we will um, address your question accordingly. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.